In a world where everyone knows everything. <laughs> yeah, right. One dad stands below everyone and yells, I know nothing. Please welcome. Please welcome. This is the Dad Who Knows Nothing podcast. All right, everyone. This is the Dad Who Knows Nothing podcast. I feel very honored to have with us today, Neil McKinley. He has spent more than 25 years immersed in the practice of meditation. So if you're looking for any information about meditation, this is the episode to listen to. Something that uh, to get any of your questions answered that you may have about meditation, how it can be an essential part of your life. And we're going to talk with Neil about how his journey came to this uh, position where he's teaching others and helping them to integrate meditation into their daily life practices. All right. So thanks for joining us, Neil. Great. Thanks. It's great to be here, Dana. I really appreciate the opportunity. All right. So meditation, you work with a lot of clients. You've done live classes for over 100 people at a time. You work with people individually. How did you get here? What was your journey to taking this on as kind of your life's work? Well, um, you know, I learned to meditate when I was a teenager. I was a competitive swimmer. And uh, one weekend, we were away at a swim meet and a, a swim coach taught us how to meditate on a Saturday evening. And for whatever reason, and I cannot provide the answer to the question of, of what the reason was, but for whatever reason, I stayed with it. And about 30 years ago, which begins to date me here, about 30 years ago, I started to get a bit more deliberate in my training. I worked with a couple of communities that are rooted in Tibetan Buddhism. I started to engage formal curriculum. I started to do long retreats. And then, you know, a number of years ago, my relationship with the second one of these communities started to sour. It became apparent that the leader was more interested in manipulating senior students than actually teaching them. And so I left. And I had been part of that group for about 20 years. And so it was a devastating loss. And yet, and yet, I found that through meditation, there were these amazing things that could happen. Through meditation, I could settle into what was going on for me, even something really difficult like loss. And that when I settled in, there was a wisdom that was waiting to be accessed that was directly relevant to what was going on in my life. And that... I could find a way to healing or recovery, I find a way more fully into my life by bringing this wisdom actually into the stuff of my life, which meant if I felt I needed to reach out, I'd reach out. If I felt I needed to go for a walk, I'd go for a walk. If I needed trauma therapy, I'd do trauma therapy and so on and so forth, which it is now frames what I offer people with this work. I offer um, an accessible and relevant grounding in the teachings and practices of meditation so that we can settle into what's going on for us, so that we can access the wisdom or the guidance or the insight that waits for us and actually bring it into our lives and let it begin to guide, shape, lead how we are in this world. Got it. Okay. So one of the phrases that you use, you use this phrase embodied meditation. Can you explain what that is? Yeah, so how meditation works, every form of meditation that I'm aware of, um, how it works is you turn your attention towards something. So if you're anything like me, your attention's always going all over the place, right? What are we going to have for dinner? When am I going to wash the dishes? How am I going to get this done? How am I going to get that done? And what meditation does is it acknowledges that our minds wander and gives us something deliberate to place our attention on. And with embodied meditation, as the name suggests, we're simply placing our attention on some aspect of our embodied experience. And a very typical place would be the breath. So we're taking our attention and out of its wandering and deliberately and repeatedly placing it on the breath, on the experience of the feet touching the floor underneath, on the tension that we feel in the lower belly. But typically the breath is a very good place to place our attention. Got it. Okay. So, and, and you mentioned about our minds going all over the place all the time. And I think that's never been more true of society than today. 
yeah with with everything that's coming at us and how many distractions and how many things there are would you agree that it's probably even more critical now to have some form of meditation to be able to quiet your mind and actually uh, o- almost almost as a way of processing things that you may be dealing with on a daily basis yeah, I think that's really true. And I think it really gets to, um, you know, a series of questions that I think are really important is, you know, I've told, I've said a little bit about my story. We've talked very briefly about how meditation works, what meditation is, you know, bringing our attention. But then the question becomes like, what's the value in our lives? And I think you've put your finger on one of the two main values is um, we live in a time of tremendous speed and tremendous uncertainty and tremendous velocity, tremendous movement. And what meditation offers us is something else we can do in the midst of this. And that's really important in the midst of this. We're not going to change how society is, how our culture is, how this moment is. But what we can do is we can step out of that speed for a moment, and it may just be a moment, and touch into a sense of stillness that is innate. It's there waiting for us. We don't need to make it. We don't need to create it. It doesn't need to be yet another project that we as busy people, busy parents, busy dads have to put on our shoulders. It's waiting for us. And so we place our attention on, let's stick with the breath, on the breath. We place our attention on the breath. We place our attention on the breath. And we begin to find a sense of settling and a sense of ease and a sense of stillness that I think, as you said, is so important, period, but so important right now where it seems like so much of our atmosphere is qualities that are very different than all that. So let's say someone is hearing this and they're saying, yeah, I need to make time for this. I need to be able to do this. How does someone develop a meditation practice to make it a practice because obviously it's one of those things where the more you do it the more benefits you're going to gain from it and a consistent approach to doing it is going to give you consistent benefits so how does someone develop that what steps should they take I mean, I think you're, you're, you've got some really good points. The more we do it, the more benefit we, we're going to get. And the more means, you know, the longer we do it, the more regularly we do it. This is true. This is true. And now you and I are both parents. And so let's lower the bar. And in my mind, anything we do in terms of meditation practice is a win. So if you meditate two minutes, five times a week, that's a win. If you meditate, uh, you know, for three minutes when you're preparing your weekend meal, that's a win. If you meditate, you know, whatever it is, one minute, you know, a day whilst you're sitting in your car and your car is parked in a parking lot and turned off and you're waiting for the kids to come, you know, this is a win. And so how do you do that? Well, I think you find the opportunities that your life provides and you take advantage of them. And we all have different lives. So it really, I've tried this in the past. It really doesn't work for me to prescribe and say, this is how it needs to go. You find the opportunities that exist in your life and you take advantage of them. And they can be as little as one minute. They can, of course, be much longer, 20 minutes, 30 minutes. And what do you do in that time? Well, like we talked about, you take your wandering attention and bring it back to, let's say the breath, just the feeling of the breath. And then when your wandering attention moves again, which it will, you bring it back to the breath, just the breath. And when it wanders, you bring it back and you take advantage of those opportunities that you've identified and begin to cultivate, begin to develop a practice that way. Um, You can certainly draw in external supports and resources, which I think are really helpful, you know, classes, workshops, recordings, podcasts, videos, there's so much out there. But that's basically, you know, if we want to make it the most uh, bare bones approach, that's it. Find the times that work for you in the realities of your life and take advantage of them by just sitting quietly and turning your attention to your experience of the breath and do that over and over and over and over again. 
Yeah, I think sometimes that um, just building an awareness and talking about it helps people to think to do that when they have those moments, right? Um, and that that was one of the reasons why I wanted to have you on the show is that, <clears throat> you know, some things, like you said, our minds wander. So when we're sitting there, you give the example of sitting in the car waiting for your kids to come in from school to get picked up. And, you know, you're thinking about everything else, your mind is racing about everything you got to do the rest of the day. So it's that building that awareness to say, hey, you have a second or a few minutes here, where there is nothing that you have to think about. So why not you do something for yourself? Why don't yeah. you do something that that provides that benefit? And I think sometimes parents, especially mothers probably are, are a little bit more susceptible to this. Uh, but definitely fathers too is sometimes you feel guilty when you take that time. But when mm -hmm. it's a short period, you know, it, it can bring those benefits that will ultimately benefit everybody that you interact with. Yeah, it, it really makes a difference in our lives. And I mean, you know, let's let's flesh that out a little bit. So what are the benefits? What what can this actually taking these three minutes whilst I'm waiting for my kid to come out of swim practice? What does taking those three minutes actually bring to my life and bring to my family life? Let's stay with parents here. And I think one thing is that that settling, that settling uh, brings a sense of relief and rejuvenation. You know, we're all very tired, we're very overworked, we're very worn down, we're very overwhelmed. And so we tap into this deep store of ease, relief, rejuvenation that resources us in what we do next, which is really, really helpful in family life. The other thing is that I've used the word insight and wisdom, you've used the word awareness, when we begin to settle in that way, we do begin to have more insight, more awareness. Um, we begin to see our lives in a fresher, clearer way. And what's the value of that? Well, we might catch that we're really a grumpy dad today. And that sounds like no big deal, but it's a huge deal because we catch that we're a grumpy dad and we kind of put a post-it note in our brain, like, okay, I'm grumpy. I'm going to be home in about 15 minutes and I'm really not going to, I'm going to try not to take this out on my family. I'm just going to hold the fact that I'm grumpy. And then maybe later tonight, I can just have some quiet time and journal or just let it out, you know, in a more appropriate manner when I go to the gym or whatever it might be. And so these two things to me, they seem like no big deal, but I think they're a big deal in the course of our everyday lives in the course of our family lives as our course as our, our role as parents and caretakers and dads. Yeah. And I would also agree that that awareness that you kind of build the ability to, because it's a muscle, right. That you'll be able to yeah. exercise and get better at. And that awareness, the ability to, to control your mind, to be present for even those few minutes, to your point, I think allows you to have that awareness when you are maybe playing with your kid, and your mind is drifting somewhere else, and you're not focusing on that moment. And it allows you to say, wait a minute, what am I doing? Let me bring my attention back here and be present in this moment. And I think that was one of the things that I noticed for myself, whenever I would, you know, meditate and was consistent with that, it to your point, it opened up this awareness. And it's almost like you are able to be outside yourself looking down on yourself and saying, Hey, you're not present in this moment that you're having right now, get back to it, you know, and, and we can deal with that other stuff at another time. And, you know, what a gift to bring into our family lives, to bring into our professional lives, to bring into our friendships, to be interacting with someone to be interacting with our child, for instance, and to have that awareness that we've developed, we've cultivated a relationship with, we've, we've built up that muscle, as you said, to have that awareness that says, oh, wow, I'm not really present right now. And so I'm just going to kind of take a moment and I'm going to see if I can really see you and really sense what's going on for you and, and you know, respond from that. It strikes me as a huge gift. Absolutely. So you mentioned, you know, some of the personal crisis that you had dealt with earlier. What does that going through that and obviously, it, it sounds like meditation played a big role in helping you through that. So what does that tell you about the link between dealing with trauma dealing with crisis and meditation? 
Is there a link mm. there? Yeah, I think so. I, I, that's a great question. I think there is a link. What And um, the link for me it is not necessarily that meditation can reveal, re re resolve, heal trauma. It can play a role in that. But what really came out of this experience for me is that meditation can help, help me find the path to healing and recovery. That was really what was shocking to me, that some days I found, you know, as I said, the loss that I went through was really devastating. This had been a central part of my life for 20 years, the community that I'd been part of. And so the loss was really devastating. And some days meditation practice itself helped me be present with that loss and helped me process and heal that loss. And some days it revealed like, okay, I'm way over my head right now. I'm locked up. I'm, I'm uh, tangled up. I'm frozen. I need something in addition to meditation practice. I need to go for a walk. I need to talk to a friend. I need to engage trauma therapy and which I did a fair bit of. And um, that to me was really, really revolu revelational to me. Not that meditation can be the cure-all, but that meditation can help me find the path to healing and recovery. And it gave me a sense of confidence that, you know, this is something that meditation can do for all of us is help us find our path. Maybe it's not, you, you know, people won't have the same specific experience that I've had. So it may not be the path to healing and recovery, but the path of our lives, we can begin to touch in on and begin to, see and understand through the practice of meditation. That, that was, the, I think, the big takeaway. So it sounds like it, it, it not only gave you something that could hold on to and help you find peace in that moment, but then also could help open your mind to potential additional resources that were needed to assist you. Yeah. And, and through that, a growing sense of confidence that I am resourced in my life. There is a sense of resilience and intelligence in my life that can help me get through this experience that is so very difficult for me. What a shock and what, a, what an affirming, life-affirming message to receive. Yeah, I talked about this a little bit with uh, one of my prior discussions on a, on a prior podcast, and we were talking about when we get back to all the feedback and all the things that we're getting thrown at us all day, all the distractions. And we were talking about how communication happens so much faster and getting feedback happens so much faster today. And I think for many that get their feedback and get their content from various sources that give it to you instantaneously or in, you know, 15, 20 second clips, you know, videos, things like that, that the feedback loop is so quick that people don't have the time to process. And mm -hmm. so to me, you know, prior generations, when it wasn't, you know, constantly being inundated with those things, they would sit out on the porch, right? And and think about what happened today and, and talk about it with a loved one. You know, the feedback loop was so much longer and the processing of that was so much longer. And now today we've kind of lost that as a society where sometimes with my kids, it's, it's like to just get them to sit down and have a conversation sometimes is difficult because they want to go, go, go. They have all these things that they want to watch and see and do, which is awesome for so many good reasons. But uh, I do think that, you know, that processing and meditation helps with that processing because it allows you to slow your mind down and really think about things that are, that are going on while at the same time, quieting your mind altogether, which mm -hmm. opens up solutions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that that point of slowing down is a really an important one. And, um, you know, when I stepped away from this community that I've been part of for a very long time, I also stepped away from an ongoing source of, of teachings and practices. And one of the things that I recognized is that I had brought that kind of speed that you're talking about into my engagement with meditation, the teachings and practices of meditation. It was like, okay, give me this and then I'll move on to the next and then I'll move on to the next. 
And so one of the things that I try to emphasize in my work, and you know, it, it means various things to various people, depending upon our circumstance, our inclination, our inspiration, and so on, is what I call kind of a slow dharma. Sometimes the Buddhist teachings are called the dharma, a slow dharma approach, meaning let's slow down and let's be here and let's take our time with this and see what we see and feel and sense. So it very much runs counter to that, that tendency that you, I think, so accurately um, identified a moment ago, is there's a very, I think there's a very deliberate kind of slowing down in meditation itself. And one of the things I'm finding in my, pra my own practice and my own work is now there's like, an added layer of deliberate slowness to it to allow us the time to experience, to contemplate, to integrate, so that this work can actually have you know, some sort of lasting effect on our lives. I mean, I think that there's a lot, as you said, there's a lot of really good things that have come out of our uh, rapid communication era. Um, and at the same time, I don't think our systems are evolved for that kind of speed. And so uh, let's try and cultivate times and places where we can slow down both individually and together. Yeah, absolutely. So you talked about this prior situation where, you know, you had a bad experience with a teacher, you ended up leaving that practice. So let's say somebody, one of our listeners wants to start and they want help, they want to be guided. So they want to look for a meditation teacher. What would you tell them they should look for? What, what are things they should look for to get that guidance to potentially, you know, start their practice? I think the first thing would be something that you can relate to. You know, there's a lot of uh, different ways people talk about meditation practice. There's different words and languages, vocabularies that people use. And so someone that presents the teachings and practices of meditation in a way that is relatable to you, you know, you hear it and you're like, oh, yes, that, that I, I kind of know what's being pointed to there. And so that relatable resonance is I think the first ingredient. And then, you know, just keeping an one's eye open to the integrity of the situation, you know, does it seem like the uh, students best interests are at the heart of what's going on here? Is there a genuine sense of care and attentiveness to how I'm developing as a student, how my what my experience is as a student? Um, those would be the, I think the two things, you know, kind of keeping it simple. Those would be two things I think would be worth tending to. Yeah. So it, it makes sense. I mean, you don't want to follow someone blindly for the entire time. If, if there's a change or you notice something and it's not serving, you know, what you need, then yeah. no, that's a great point. And I think that resonance, that personal resonance is really, really important. You know, this stuff, these teachings, these practices, they come alive when they're in our life. And so in order for that to happen, they need to be some, somehow relatable for, uh, for us. Whether, you know, it's framed in the language of being a parent or it's framed in the language of um, psychology or science or Buddhism. There's a lot of different ways that the teachings and practices are presented. And so, you know, do a little uh, due diligence, a little looking around and trust your sense of uh, when it feels like it resonates for you, when it feels like it's relevant and just kind of look into it a little bit more. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So you have a podcast as well, bringing meditation to life. What, yeah. what, do, you, what do you mean by that? by that phrase, the title of your podcast. How long have you been doing it, by the way? I've probably been doing the podcast for about a year now. So oh, it's a okay. fairly new undertaking. And, um, you know, in some ways that phrase, um, cap bringing meditation to life captures, it kind of summates everything I do. You know, I tell people that I provide an accessible and relevant grounding to the teachings and practices of meditation so that we can deepen our relationship with the stillness and the wisdom we were born with and bring these into our lives, bringing meditation to life. I encourage, educate, encourage, and empower 
us to bring meditation into our lives. And one of the things that I've noticed in myself over the years, and I've noticed in others that I work with over the years, is sometimes there's a tendency not to bring meditation into our lives, but treat them as separate. So you meditate, and then you go and wash the dishes. And what I find is, as I've said a few moments ago, it is that gulf, when we can narrow that gulf, that sense of separation between meditation and washing the dishes, and we can let the experience of meditation percolate into washing the dishes, and importantly, let the experience of washing the dishes percolate into our understanding and experience of meditation. There's something that comes to life. And so with the podcast, I try to encourage narrowing that gap. And so sometimes I do short essay style podcasts or episodes where I'm reflecting upon, for instance, the ways in which um, um, Bob Dylan's singing voice reminds me of meditation practice, bringing those two seemingly separate worlds together, or Cormac McCarthy's The Road, how that to me is a, a manifestation of a meditation practice. And then the other thing I do, I kind of alternate formats, is I do interviews with uh, meditators I know, and just hear a little bit about, you know, what's your life and what's your practice look like? So that maybe those who are listening can go, well, wow, that's kind of how it is for me. And they're like me, you know, they don't have a book and they don't have a podcast and they don't have a, you know, a, a website. They're an ordinary person like me. And they're describing how meditation is or, and, or providing insights that help me go deeper in my practice. So just, it, it's an effort to really bridge that gap, really bring together those two, not necessarily that not necessarily separate solitudes, meditation in our everyday life. Nice. Well, sounds really good. Uh, so for my listeners, if you wanted them to take one thing from this episode, what do you think it would be if you wanted them to have that as a takeaway? I, I'm going to cheat and say two. <laughs> okay. Can I do two? Absolutely. <laughs> one thing is that, you know, meditation has something to offer our lives. I'm, I'm confident in that. Meditation has something to offer our lives. And the second thing is um, the bar doesn't need to be really hard, high. You know, sometimes when I'm working with people, um, I notice that it, it can be difficult to be honest with one another about when we don't meditate. Curiously, as years go on, I notice that it's even more difficult to be honest with one another about when we do meditate. There's a tendency to dismiss those one and two and three minute sessions that we were talking about a while ago. And I think that would be the second thing that I would, I would pass on to your listeners. One, meditation has something to offer our, our busy, harried, um, overwhelmed modern lives. And two, that the bar doesn't need to be that high. One minute is a meditation practice. Three minutes is a meditation practice. And I think given the, the tenor of so many of our, our life circumstances, when we approach meditation in that way, it actually has an opportunity to establish a toehold as opposed to me saying like, well, okay, if you're going to get any benefit from this, you have to meditate an hour a day every day for the rest of your life. That's not going to go very well for most of us. So let's go the other direction and build from there. Yeah, any little bit that you can devote to meditation, you'll see some benefits. No, I appreciate yeah. that. Very yeah, nice. Let's celebrate that. Yep, absolutely. Well, instead of thinking about what we can't do, we're thinking about what we've been able to do. Yeah, that's a great way of putting it. I love that, that you said being able to do, not what we can do, but what we've been able to do. Right. That's great. All right. Well, his name is Neil McKinley. He has a website, neilmckinley.com. I'll put that in the show notes. So if anybody wants to get, there's a lot of great content on the website about meditation itself and certainly ways to contact you, Neil, if they have that. Also have the Bringing Meditation to Life podcast uh, is the best way for them to get in touch with you. If, if my listeners, anybody wanted to learn more about meditation, is that through the website? Is that the best way? I'd say go to the website. It offers a great overview and more particularly sign up for my newsletter. It shows up one roughly 
once a month. Sometimes I'll send something a little bit more frequently than that, but it gradually exposes you to all that is actually being offered. So you can gradually get a sense of, of what I'm offered at offering as we all try to bring meditation to life. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, Neil. This has been a nice conversation. I've enjoyed it. I've enjoyed talking with you about meditation. Uh, good luck with your continued practice and working with your clients and uh, helping to bring uh, meditation to life. So thank you very much, Neil, for your time today. Thank you. My pleasure. Great to be here. Thank you for joining us on our journey to learn about various topics. If you'd like to get in touch with the dad who knows nothing, connect with him at the dad who knows nothing on TikTok and Instagram or dad knows zero on Twitter. If you have a moment and you like this episode, drop us a review wherever you listen to your podcasts. Have a great day and enjoy your journey through this game called life. <laughs>